uh, the the title of my talk might be a little misleading it says create awesome api time limit equal to one week um, but once once i go through the slides you will realize that it's more about uh, an account of our experiences using python at plevo so let me get to that uh, about me my name is nishad mustafa i was the first engineer at plevo uh, plevo is a cloud telephony api what that means is you can use code to integrate telephony into your web applications you don't need to know anything about hardware switches soft switches carrier integrations etc uh, all you need to know is python for example or any other web framework and you could integrate it into uh, your f telephone i mean your web applications like you could have a click to call button within your uh, website you could you could use you could build a conferencing application using uh, just simple python code you can have an ivr menu built up etc so uh, I, once i go through those slides you will get a little more uh, detail into it the second thing is i i am an absolute fan of open source uh, and so is everyone at plevo we are, uh, we are off uh, com completely built out of open source uh, software uh how many of you know about the zen of python okay for those who don't know if you got your python console open just type import this and click enter uh you will get a set of wonderful guidelines which uh, is not just specific to software but life in general like for example there's one single line that says uh now is better than never that's that's one of the things that made me quit my comfortable job at adobe and join a startup like plevo all right that's my twitter uh, handle underscore nishad all right plevo open source first off i'll explain what fs is fs stands for free switch free uh, so uh, you're aware of what a telephone exchange is right a telephone exchange is something where you get calls in and you route calls outside right so this is essentially a software that does that think of it that way but however free switch has some issues it's completely built out of c people who want to make uh simple web applications out using free switch uh, the, see even to make a simple call out of free switch and if you're uh, a higher level uh, c programmer you probably take a week so uh, i mean if uh, if you want to actually make a proper web application out of free switch it's next to impossible free switch however exposes its events using something called esl which stands for the event socket library which could be interf used to interface with any sort of uh, socket framework like for example python python has a specific set of libraries which help you connect to sockets right which is what the plevo framework is you you could check it out at github.com/plevo/plevoframework it's essentially a python library that helps you make telephone calls or send sms's etc by interfacing with free switch all right so how does plevo work essentially you get a call plevo needs to know what to do with the call and how do we get that information from the user we need to be provided a url like http customercallback.com so at that point of time plevo sends a request to that url and gets back a sort of syntax and it executes what needs to be executed during a call like for example uh welcome to my website please enter one for english two for uh, cantonese uh, so so those kind of uh, uh, that that in those set of instructions can be got from a url however a url would mean a request to another uh, website right so how uh, you know that a request to a website is a network operation that would take some amount of time it it slows down the whole process when when that happens so that's that's the kind of uh, that's the first problem that we had to think about at plevo like how do we uh, architect the system 
to bring down this entire network time. And that, that's kind of what we're going to talk about in the next few slides. So this is our initial setup. We had Plevo uh, connected with FreeSwitch on a box called the media server. This is a box that has live telephone calls happening uh, all the time. So uh, hence the name, the media server. However, you can't have a telephony application without any information about the customer, right? For example, we, we, we have to build the customer, right? Which would require that we have a DB, a database. And we also need to have a module that sends callbacks and receives the information from those call, callbacks. And of course, the customer would be initiating API requests into our platform. This was the initial setup that we had. There were issues with this setup. All right. Uh, there are two aspects to the code that we had. One was the telephony code where we had to interface with the carriers, uh, receive calls, route the calls correctly, etc. And the other was the business logic. Like I said, for example, credits of the person. Suppose the guy's credit has gone below zero. We, do, we shouldn't allow calls to happen anymore, right? So that, that part is the business logic. And the other part is telephony, uh, which takes care of the routing and everything. <coughs> now the problem is, Updates in this part of the code happen much more often than the telephony. Telephony code has to be really stable and tested and tried. Uh, we can't have random updates in t the telephony code, whereas business logic is a little more forgiving in that sense. Okay, Code updates were an issue with this setup. Imagine, in this media server, you have a 1,000 calls happening, and then you figure out that there's this crucial bug in the business logic, and you had to fix it. I, uh, until the calls go down to zero, I cannot make an update over here. Calls will start dropping then, right? So that, that, that was the first problem that we faced. And also, when you have one server doing everything, you obviously will run into scaling issues. We had to have uh, uh, much more the number of uh, uh, servers that we had at that point of time uh, than uh, we have right now to run telephone calls because we solved our scaling issues. Let me, uh, I'll get into how we did that now. So this was the solution that we came up with first. Uh, how many of you are aware of Django? All right, that's good. Uh, so we had a Django server which was connected to the da uh, database and which took care of the callbacks. Okay. And we separated all the business logic into that server. The customer API calls would come into this Django server. And it would interface with uh, the uh, Plevo would request Django for any, um, any information related to the customer. Like say, how much do I deduct for this customer per minute? Those kind of information would be fetched from Plevo, uh, by Plevo. Uh, from the Django server, OK? So this looks good, right? Well, not quite. I mean, we felt it was good, but there were still some issues with this setup that we had. First thing we had run into was performance issues with Django. Uh, we couldn't, uh, this, this is mainly because of that other part that you saw. You saw callbacks over here, right? There was a lot of network related uh, uh, this thing, latency that we had when we made the callbacks from Django. That, that's probably because Django is not well uh, architected to deal with certain uh, uh, calls that, uh, I mean, basically, uh, how many of you are aware of the GIL issue with Python? This is called the global interpreter lock. Essentially, what it means is Python can run only on a single thread, unless you use something like uh, the multiprocessing module. But uh, we, 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 we came up with a better solution than the multiprocessing module, which uh, suited us, uh, which, which suited our needs better. So 
like I said, the essential issue was this. Django making callbacks to other websites was causing a lot of blocking in our code. And it was reducing the number of requests that we could take per second. All right? Also, security issues. Now, we have customers making API calls here and the callbacks being sent out from Django. And this is a server which is directly in touch with the DB. Once you make, there are obviously ways that you can figure out the IP address of this box over here. That, that's a security issue which we also thought we needed to fix. Uh, is that, was that not clear? The part about the uh, IP addresses over here? Clear, right? Cool. So we came up with a solution that involved using a lightweight proxy server written in Flask. And uh, how many of you have heard of this framework called G-Event? Yeah, G-Event is an event-based, uh, a greenlit-based uh, library that kind of solves the global interpreter log problem that Python has. <coughs> it's, you know, it, it works very, very well with Flask, but not so great with Django. OK? And uh, so actually, huh? Well, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's essentially because of uh, the way the code is architected in Django. Uh, Flask is more uh, lightweight, and it, it helps you uh, use the event-based framework from uh, G-Event in a much more friendly way. Isn't Steve just Python in the end, though, like, regardless of the framework? Right, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's all always about uh, uh, how the API calls are made and which parts are more blocking, et cetera, the, the, the order in which it's done. So the way you integrate G-Event is you just add an extra line called import monkey patch. Right? You're not supposed to make any other uh, changes in uh, any other part of your code. It's just supposed to work that way. That doesn't work so well with Django. Cool. And like I said, it, it acts as both an in and out proxy. What that would mean is, it acts as a proxy when customers make API calls to our platform. And it also acts as a proxy when callbacks are made outside to collect that information from the other APIs. I mean, the other URLs that the customer gives to control calls. So this, is our new, this was our new setup that we had. And uh, right, so. I'll just let you absorb that. It, it, the, the database is directly connected with Django. The media server co communicates with both Django for the customer-related information and with the proxy to get uh, the information related to the calls, how to control the calls. All right? OK, so we were in a comfortable position for some time. We added a Django-based UI also to manipulate the customer information. Uh, apart from uh, account credits, there was a lot, there's a lot of other Plevo-specific customer information that I'm not going to get to right now. But yeah, it was good. And we didn't, make, uh, we didn't feel like we needed an API to manipulate this information, like the customer, uh, like, uh, say, for, for example, there is, there is one uh, model in Django that is as critical to making outbound uh, calls uh, that we uh, that customers were just happy with adjusting in the UI of our uh, uh, website. However, we got a new customer suddenly who said he needed an API for all of those. He was not happy with doing a UI because he wanted to manipulate all that information in real time. So we had like, <laughs> it was a funny mail that we had. He was, he was bringing in about 4 million minutes into our platform. And we'd, we had like one week to respond to him. And we didn't have any APIs for any of it. So we, we were like in a crisis situation at that point of time. And we were wondering what to do. And if you go back to the architecture, all of these APIs are tied to the uh, DB 
through Django models. Okay. So when you hear Django and models and API, uh, is is there anything that comes to anybody's mind right now? Tasty pie. Yeah. Tasty pie is the first thing that. Uh, it's not actually the first thing that came to our mind. It was Piston that came uh, to our mind initially. But we did a comparison between the two, and we found out that TastyPy was much uh, suited to our applications. Like, Piston was lacking. Take this example. We have an, uh, we have an API that, uh, that, is associate, uh, that, that helps you get information about sub-accounts of accounts. Okay? Take this example. We have account and account ID and sub account. This gives you all the sub accounts that are under a particular account. Okay? And this is account slash sub account ID. You can, you can directly access the information about a sub account using the account uh, API itself. Because the, uh, auth, I mean, the ID parameter for both are similar. So we wanted to do something like this. But the limitation that Piston had was that you can't use the same model across two resources. So this is the sub-account resource, and this is the account resource. But I wanted to use the same model across both. Piston doesn't even let us do this. So that, that's when we said bye-bye to Piston. OK, uh, basics of TastyPy. The way you expose a model in TastyPy as a resource, as an API, is using the model resource, using the model resource uh, class from TastyPy. So this is a simple example. Like you expose the account model. This is the query set that will be used, and these are the methods that are allowed for that resource. A simple, basic example of how you'd use TastyPy. So. Um, <coughs> A uh, quick question. What are the different methods that you are aware of in REST APIs? All right. So yeah. So this, uh, there are two types of gets. OK? One would be to get all the items, and one would be to get, this, uh, get the detail of a specific item. So uh, that, that is retrieve list and retrieve detail. If you wanted to modify how TastyPy would uh, access information about a specific uh, model. Say, if I wanted uh, all the account objects, and I wanted uh, to add some information related to the credit from the credit model into the account model, right? I would use dispatch list. That's the function from TastyPy that you would want to override to do something like that. Dispatch detail. Uh, with method, with both these with method equal to get would give, uh, would let you uh, customize the functionality of retrieve list and retrieve detail. And then comes create. Create two is a dispatch list because you wouldn't be providing an ID for uh, an API. So consider this. Suppose you wanted to create an, a sub account under a particular account. You would use dispatch list with method equal to post. That's what you'd be doing. Um, dispatch detail with method equal to post would be how you would update a model. And uh, this is a separate function that helps you delete uh, items in your database using uh, delete detail. And these are some of the uh, guidelines of best practices that we can offer from our experience using TastyPy. Uh, always create a separate derivation of model resource from TastyPy, because there's, there's a lot of custom business logic that you'd want to tie to your, your implementation, which you wouldn't want to uh, rewrite too many times in specific models. Like, it's a, like, for example, uh, we had a necessity that all the error codes would have to be returned in JSON. So we created a separate error 
send error function which we tie to our model resource that would convert everything to JSON. And the dehydrate function is extremely useful. For example, um, information associated to our te telephone calls had two separate uh, rate entities. One is called uh, a carrier rate, which, which is the amount of uh, money that the carrier charges us. And the other is the cloud rate, which is the amount of money that is used in uh, uh, consumed in using our uh, infrastructure. However, we didn't want to uh, provide this information as two separate fields to a customer. But it was stored in our database as two separate fields. So what we would do is, uh, in the dehydrate function that is associated with uh, the model resource of tasty fields, you can add these two and delete uh, those single elements and show as a combined charge using the de dehydrate function. In fact, I could uh, pick up some code and just show that to you. There you go. It would look like this. This is how you would combine the code, uh, combine those two rates and then display it. And this is how uh, this th this is how you'd unify the information in your API. This is an example of the code. All right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there were two things that we uh, did additionally to speed up our uh, performance. Uh, one is Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash is uh, a cache associated with your database queries. It's not uh, like a HTTP cache. It's 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 a database cache. So suppose you your application uh, makes a lot of calls uh, and has a uh, makes repeated calls to the same query. Uh, Johnny Cash would store the result of that query, and if it is not uh, if uh, it, there are invalidations to that cache that occur whenever an update is made to that field. However, till then that fi uh, that data will remain in Johnny Cache, and if if the if the query is made from Django, it doesn't go to the database. It goes to Johnny Cache and fetches that information. Th there's a tremendous amount of uh, speed up that occurs if you use something like Johnny Cache. And then we use Django Celery Wh whenever. Uh, I think there's another talk by uh, Narhari uh, about uh, this later on, uh, but so 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 I won't get into too much detail about that. But J uh, Django Celery is meant to do uh, jobs that uh, would take up too much of your request time. Suppose you have you're sending a request in, and it's taking more than like a hundred milliseconds to perform that job. You'd, you'd rather uh, add it to a queue using Django Celery and execute it as a separate batch job. Uh, we, we did that with a bunch of things that we had, like creating the uh, details for our calls uh, in, our, in the database, uh, the call detail records, that's what they're called. Uh, and uh, similarly, we had to do it for uh, uh, Auto recharging the credits that we had for uh, because it involves a call to the credit card networks, so we had to uh, separate that out too as a batch job. I I think I am done right now, but yeah, one week later we had a very happy customer who is happy even to this day. Anyone questions? Is there a one-to-one matter between uh, models and resources? Uh, not really. I mean, it. Uh, like I said, we we had mapped two more uh, two uh, resources to a single model. It's it's not necessary. It it is it it is that case in Piston, but not the same in KCPy. Are you aware of Django REST framework? It's an also like KCPy new player that I think is picking up. Uh, yeah, we, we, so we, we, we started out with this uh, about uh, 
a year back when the Django REST framework was not mature enough. Mm -hmm. TCPy was uh, the new kid in the block, mm -hmm. and Piston was the old dinosaur that was just dying off. So uh, we went for TCPy. Okay, so you don't you can't compare the two. Right now, maybe mm -hmm. uh, I haven't looked into that recently. So <coughs> any other questions? When you say you had problems with Django's concurrency, like how many requests, how many concurrent requests are you talking about? Um, we, uh, this this is also likely because of the num uh, machine configuration we had, but it it was uh, blocked at like three hundred per second, okay. which was not enough for us. Okay. That's like I said. It uh, I'm pretty sure there are ways to speed that up, uh, but. Uh, we were looking at using G-Event and uh, uh, looking at the timelines that we had, uh, we went with Flask and G-Event after that, which which went up to 2,000 requests a second. If you consider uh, Node.js instead of G-Event? Uh, Node.js is, so so we were looking at uh, Python, so okay. yeah, we, which was primarily more or not, not Node.js, right? So, yeah, I'm sure it could, like, I haven't benchmarked it, and I can't talk without benchmarking, but yeah. You said you redu reduced your hardware needs because of these changes. Right. So, so uh, there are two aspects to it. One is the web requests, uh, uh, the, the latency in web requests. The other is also uh, the processing that free switch requires because of things like be, uh, the web framework being in the same machine, etc. So initially we could take only 300 concurrent calls on a single machine, but now we can do like 2,000 on one. That those there are many reasons also. We have one that I haven't mentioned quite here, which is a no-brainer actually. We moved from uh, virtual machines to dedicated boxes. So that 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 itself gave us a a uh, much higher uh, amount of calls that we could take on a single server, telephone calls, not API calls. All, all, the, API, all the API calls uh, mean real time. Means there's no API call that you put in the queue first to increase the, the throughput. So that depends. Uh, um, like if, if you consider, there's one API call in Plevo that lets you start and stop a recording of a telephone call. Okay, okay so we can't, uh, we can't put that into the queue. We have to make that real time. Okay. Uh, if we add any delay in that, it's, it's like killing business. Like, right, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not going to lead to customer satisfaction over there. Uh, that's, that's one thing. But the other thing was like, uh, when, when the call ends, there's an API call from FreeSwitch to Django to store the call detail record, like it gets stored into the database. That's not customer critical. And it takes a hell of a lot of time too. Uh, not, not a hell of a lot of time, but compared to other uh, API calls. So we decided that could be pushed to a batch processing job like Celery. Uh, what kind of, of database do you guys use? We use Postgres. We use Postgres, yeah. Yeah? Who are your main customers and how are they using your, your stuff? Uh, so we, we, we cater to businesses primarily. We have uh, call centers built on top of Plevo. We have, um, we have uh, conferencing solutions. We also have this uh, set of customers who do something, uh, who do uh, voice broadcasting. Basically, you get a lot of, they send out a lot of calls for uh, specific um, either uh, customer surveys or uh, customer, uh, I mean lead generation and stuff like that. So primarily businesses, but we do have, th there's a blog that has been put up about, you can search for replacing Skype with Plevo. There's a blog out there. It, it talks about how you can save a lot of money uh, with a few simple steps by uh, using our APIs too. I mean, th those are specific examples of uh, end consumers using Plevo directly. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit more about your Flask and Django? Uh, how, how does it work again, using G-Event on Flask and then showing the request to Django? And so, so that way, what, what happens is, um, 
we we have flask and g event on uh, amazon ec2 instances however uh, flask has to communicate with both the media server as well as django uh, and uh, it it depends on the latency uh, between the uh, requests right so uh, some requests that the requests that go between flask and the media server are more time critical they are like like, like i said that example of stopping and starting a recording that's directly between flask and uh, uh, the media server whereas those requests that go between the media server and django are a little less time critical so uh, i mean do you want me to go back to that slide that's well that's the one so the proxy is what we have flask written in written in flask and this is the django server this is the media server so these are pretty quick and uh, come back pretty fast those are a little more uh, take a little more time so that's that's how it is basically she switches it's a sip based problem yeah it's it's a sip based uh, i mean it's it's not just um, it i mean you can have sip uh, implemented on it also uh I think that that is a f a t a th those things are uh, a topic for another day and for probably another conference like a VoIP conference or something. But yeah, it's it's essentially uh, it's it's SIP based. Uh, you can use other protocols too. Uh, but um, at the heart, it is a telephony switch. It's a soft switch. Yeah. Do you have an agreement with the NSA to provide? <laughs> <laughs> I can't comment on that right. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much for having me here and All right.